Okay, I guess we're live. Hey, everybody, welcome to Odyssey. I'm super glad that you're here, so thanks for attending. My name is Alex Drag, and I'm really happy and really excited to be moderating this session today. Um, first and foremost, I want to give a big thank, uh, thank you and a shout out to Catalan for sponsoring this talk. Um, so you all know, Catalan, Catalan is a uh, it's a testing platform that offers a flexible platform for web, API, mobile, and desktop app, uh, app testing that fits that fits for any teams and products of any size for any purpose, whether that's creating tests, executing tests, building and sharing reports, and, and uh, offers seamless integrations within the CI/CD ecosystem. Um, so after this session, if you're curious, make sure to go check out their virtual booth and uh, in the exhibitors tab and chat with the representatives if you have any questions. Just as a reminder, this session as well as all of our other sessions today will be available as recordings. Um, that you can access on demand in the near future. So you'll be notified as soon as those sessions are available. Um, and throughout the session, make sure that you feel free to chat and ask questions. There'll be a um, chat panel and a Q&A panel. Um, we'll have dedicated Q&A at the end of the presentation. We should have 10, 15 minutes. So any questions you have at all, make sure to put that in the Q&A panel. So our speaker today is Cody Rosenblatt. And he's presenting a session on improving mobile quality um, with shift right testing. Cody is the chief technology officer at Catalan and we're super pumped and super happy, happy to have him here at Odyssey. So Cody, with that, go ahead and uh, take it away. All right, thanks Alex. I uh, start sharing my screen and uh, thanks everybody for joining me here today. Uh, as Alex said, I'm Cody Rosenblatt, chief technology officer at Catalan. Um, I realize I did not get all of my LinkedIn contact information in here, um, but I'm at Cody on Twitter. I am Cody at Catalan.com if you uh, want to contact me. And uh, with that, we'll start our uh, discussion. So as I said, we're going to talk about improving mobile quality with shift right testing. Um, before we jump into that, I'll just give a brief introduction uh, to Catalan as well. Um, you may know Catalan from our Catalan Studio product. It was our first uh, test automation product, and it allowed you to author uh, tests by recording and playing back and customizing scripts and would do that across a wide variety of platforms. And uh, it's been well received. Last year, for the second year in a row, we received an award from Gartner's Peer Insights as best test automation software. But these days, uh, Catalan is more than just Studio. We are an all-in-one testing platform that also includes Catalan Recorder and Catalan Test Ops. We help you test across a variety of platforms, doing API testing, mobile testing, web testing, desktop testing on Android, iOS, many browser platforms. And of course, in mobile testing, we integrate with uh, our partners at Cobaton. We have a plugin. Uh, for the Cobaton system that really simplifies, uh, you know, connecting to devices and uh, executing tests on the Cobaton platform. In my presentation, I'll mention um, a couple of our products along the way, and I'll also mention some third-party products. Those are really just meant as examples. Um, for the most part, this is about sort of the concepts of uh, shift right testing. And as we go through uh, I'll also be talking about shift right testing as a general topic. Um, and I'll be calling out some special considerations to take into account uh, when attempting to shift right on mobile platforms. So I'll be looking for that and I'll, I'll call it out as we get into it. So, you know, just to give a preview of sort of the structure of the uh, discussion, we'll start out with a brief discussion of what shift right testing is. We'll talk about why. Uh, why you should shift right, why you might have to shift right. We'll talk a little bit about uh, shift left versus shift right um, and how they compare and how they work together. Um, and finally, we'll spend the most of uh, our time talking about some testing practices that we think can help you get the most out of shift right testing, things that help you learn from those tests uh, in the most effective way. So as I said, let's start out with what is shift right testing. So we're all on the same page. And the right in test right, I think probably a lot of you knows, but we'll just kind of re -go, go over it again. 
the right and shift right is really referring to uh, you know, the right side of an imaginary or a real uh, pipeline of development, right? We, if we imagine that we start on the left with design, we build, we test, we deploy, and then we put it into active use and production, everything after that appointment, that's the right, that's the right-hand side. So, you know, we work to shift left and move testing uh, earlier in the process, but there's also things to be learned from shifting to the right. And that's what we'll uh, talk about today. But you know, before we finish with the question of uh, what is shift right, I think there's also a question that comes up that is, so is this just testing in production? And of course, the answer is both yes and no. Um, it's yes, because I just told you uh, the right is about you know, post-deployment post production environments. Um, but it's not testing in production in the way this meme, uh, which is frequently uh, deployed pejoratively or cynically uh, by engineers means it. So, right, I don't, although I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. This isn't about ignoring uh, testing prior to production and just waiting to see what happens. This is gonna be about how to get the most out of the test that you can run in production and, and why you might need to do that. So we just discussed you know, what shifting right is. So why should you shift right? Um, why can't you get all of your testing done prior to production? Um, again, that may not be uh, that mysterious a question to people who are engaged in it, because um, there's lots of answers. There's <laughs> just time constraints. But I think the main reason is because there is no other place like production, just like there's no place like home to bring up another uh, meme. There's no place like production for a number of reasons. One is scale. And I often reflect on this because I started my career in uh, software development slightly before sort of the advent of uh, it, the internet, uh, at least as an application deployment platform. And before that, I think it was harder to have applications that operated at the scale that we do today. Um, you know, in the past, before the internet was uh, a, a open platform de for deployment, um, it was hard to get, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, certainly millions of people using uh, a single version of your application. But today, you know, a relatively small SaaS application could easily have thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of customers. And that scale produces data and transactions that are very hard to reproduce in any environment prior to your production. You just, you can't afford to build out something that is going to have uh, the capacity to scale like your production environment. And you're frankly gonna have a hard time producing the data that would simulate it. Your production environment is also gonna be necessarily more complex than any other environment you're likely to build or that is reasonable to build. It's gonna be where you have your CDNs deployed, your load balancers, all your you know, potential network connections to partner systems. It, it's where everything comes together. And it's unlikely you're gonna see everything that you could prior to that environment. So what we're gonna talk about today is you know, how, to, how to get from that, how to learn from that, how to test there and how to learn from it. It's also the environment that is the most complete. Um, it's gonna have all your latest functionality. Again, it's gonna have all your latest connectivity. Um, it's gonna be the place that you have tools in place for systems monitoring, for you know, your marketing system may have scripts deployed to uh, observe customer behaviors that you don't have or that don't really receive much use in your pre-production environments. And those scripts, can affect the way your application runs. And that, that's an important thing to remember. So we shift right because production is distinct. If we wanna, we also have in our modern environments, continuous deployment into the production, continuous delivery. In many organizations, you may be releasing new code throughout the day, multiple times a day. Certainly we are far away from when we used to deliver you know, maybe only at the end of sprints or even longer durations. 
And in order to support that you know, rapid delivery of functions, we've got to be looking at it as it hits the most complex and most uh, elaborate parts of our uh, environment. But one thing I'll pull out that I think is really particularly compelling about shift right testing, and that is that it can encourage collaboration among groups that aren't always looking in the same place. And those are your developers, your quality engineers, your quality uh, professionals, and your operations professionals. Your developers are often looking uh, at their development system. Maybe it's uh, their laptop, uh, maybe it's uh, another development environment that they have access to. And that's where we get the, well, it works on my, uh, works on my system sort of uh, cynical comment. QA is looking into test environments and maybe as they shift right, they're looking into production. Operations is really always focused on production. And if you can start to develop conversations among those groups about how the application behaves in the place where it really matters, I think that's really powerful and something to to look forward to and keep in mind. Another reason that shifting your testing to the right is valuable is because ultimately that is where value is created. And you can see that in this uh, set of responses to a survey that was part of uh, Capgemini's continuous testing report from last year, where they asked, you know, how do you measure the effectiveness of your continuous testing process? And the top two uh, survey results are by looking at production data and from user feedback and the adoption of new functionality. Those are the things that deliver value. Further down the list, you'll see things that you know, we often look at as engineers, quality professionals, things like requirements coverage, uh, automation, code coverage. Those are all important, but ultimately they are there to support those value delivery uh, features in production. Similarly, uh, from that same report, uh, there's another survey to ask what continuous testing practices are you putting in place? And the one that is you know, at the top is testing in production. So you know, I think this would be even bigger if we were defining testing in production in the, again, the somewhat pejorative sense of uh, just jumping into production because I didn't test in earlier environments. I think what this is really talking about is what, what we're talking about in terms of shifting right. And that is taking tests that we've already executed, that we've already built, and, and not just automated tests, but also exploratory manual tests and applying them to production so that we can see how, my, how, how our applications behave in that you know, richest of environments. And so we can learn from that. So now we've talked about you know, what shifting right is, why we want to shift right. The existence of shift right suggests that there is a shift left. And that raises the question, are they mutually exclusive or complementary? Well, what if I told you you could test both in prod and before prod? Because ultimately, I think we all, I may be, this probably isn't the big uh, reveal uh, that I set it up as, ultimately, we're shooting for testing all along our life cycle. And unlike that original you know, pipeline that I drew, it really just, it doesn't start one place and end, right? If, if we're lucky, uh, it goes on and on. And in particular, it goes from our ideation, development, integration and testing into deployment, testing in production and learning from those tests, learning from monitoring in production analyzing those results, and then feeding that right back into the cycle. And I think that's ultimately what we're looking for. But sometimes, you know, we, we give short shrift to shifting right, and that's why I want to talk about that today. But if we compare and contrast them, shift left testing is about uh, preventing uh, problems early. Instead of testing only at the end of development, we're trying to push testing earlier and earlier in the process. Um, we want to get core, core functions and coverage uh, early in the process if we can. Shift right testing is about detecting issues that may only be revealed in that uh, post production, that post deployment environment, in that production environment, um, and making sure that critical functionality functions even, even there. 
And, you know, as I said earlier, that combination of shift right and shift left testing gives us continual, continuous coverage and continuous learning uh, throughout the product lifecycle. So now I've talked about, you know, what uh, shift right testing is. Um, I've talked about uh, why we want to do it and compared it to shift uh, left testing. Now I want to talk about some practices that we think, and they're not an exhaustive list, but some practices that we think uh, are critical to learning from shift right testing. So I'm not going to be talking, you know, just about, I'm not going to be talking about how to run the tests per se. They could be automated tests. They could be manual tests that you execute, but it's about how to prepare to take, make the most of those, how to get value from them, how to learn from them. Because uh, to deploy another uh, meme, one does not simply test in production. You know, going back to my original uh, premise, shift right testing is not about, you know, just arbitrarily testing things in production because you didn't do it earlier. It's about executing tests in production that you can learn from. And so what I'm gonna talk about here is how to be prepared to learn from those tests. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of mobile testing, as we go through each of these uh, practices, I'll talk about how mobile testing in particular, uh, what considerations may need, may need to be taken into account. And we've got four practices that we're gonna talk about, and they're split into two groups. Two of them are about deployment, how you get your software into production and how that can support uh, shift right testing. And two are about monitoring, how you, you know, watch what happens in your production environment and how that, again, can support your testing. So the first of our deployment approaches is what's called a canary release. And this isn't you know, terribly complicated, but I think it's worth uh, talking about. The notion behind a canary release, and, and the, the term comes from a uh, canary in a coal mine, having something that is going to, you're gonna deploy that is going to warn you about uh, issues. So the canary would warn you if there was uh, an oxygen uh, issue in the coal mine, Canary releases aren't always about warning you about bad things. Sometimes, sometimes they're just about getting new features into uh, an environment where you can test against them. So the notion in canary uh, releasing is that you've got a release already in your production environment, and you're going to take some subset of production, uh, maybe a server, maybe you know, a cluster of servers, and you're going to deploy your next release into that. And then you're going to use typically some part of your infrastructure to separate your user base. Maybe it's maybe you're doing it through load balancing, maybe you're doing it in mobile applications, you may be uh, choosing to connect to different um, backend endpoints, but you're splitting some of the usage so that generally the bulk of your usage stays on your, you know, let's say 1.0 release, and then the rest is cycled over into your next release where you can start to both have real usage and do some of your testing. Again, automated testing or manual testing applied against this new release. And that's a place where now you can learn, you know, if there was anything that was missed in earlier environments, pre-production environments, maybe that didn't have all the complexity. You also, because you're not just doing testing, you're also putting some real load on the system. You start to see whether there are usages, users, devices that you haven't seen before that bring out different behaviors uh, in the system. And you do it in a controlled fashion so that over time, you can start to deploy more and more of your new software into the environment. And eventually all your systems are running 1.1. Uh, .1. In addition to functionality, another you know, major way that Canary releases are used is a way of testing new infrastructure, right? Because they give you the opportunity to Maybe in your 1.1 version, you have switched your queuing from uh, SQS to Kafka, or you've switched your database. Uh, this is a, a wild switch, but you know, from one database version, uh, type to another, from MySQL to Postgres or Postgres to MySQL. Those are things that you can do uh, in a canary release strategy. You know, given that description, 
I want to talk about you know, a couple of things that when you're doing this with a mobile application, uh, you need to keep in mind. And those are that mobile applications, unlike your you know, standard web application, you've typically got two parts to the application. You've got your backend APIs and you have your front end mobile application. Those are going to have to be coordinated in your Canary release. Um, you will probably need to release your backend in advance, and then you're going to need to release uh, your new mobile uh, system into you know either maybe your test flight beta release cycle, or um, maybe we'll talk about this as the very next thing. Maybe you'll have switches in your mobile application that let switch between your uh, different backends. So. I kind of led into this um, in my previous statement. Um, our second deployment strategy is what's called dark launching. And dark launching is where you release a feature uh, and that a critical component of dark launching is what we call feature fighting. So you release a feature and you take the functionality for that feature, the code behind that feature, and you put it behind a flag that allows you to control whether or not it is visible to a given user or segment of users. And it's really not a whole lot more complicated than just that. There's putting uh, a Boolean uh, if then clause around code that you're deploying. Now, there are a lot of uh, solutions for this. I have a graphic here from LaunchDarkly, which is a, a major, a well-known uh, commercial version, but there are open source uh, libraries for feature flagging. And they all add uh, you know, degrees of completeness to it. So they give you, you know, better ways to group users together and they optimize the, the ways that you can turn on and turn off the flags and make sure that those flags cost as little as possible to check and execute. But in general, they give you a way to deploy software and then gradually reveal new features in that software to your customer base. And you may do that in any number of ways. You may do it by uh, features of a given customer set. So um, maybe you've grouped people by uh, regions and you wanna release it to a, a one region or another, or maybe by device types. Um, or maybe you're gonna do it at random because you're um, doing some sort of experimentation and you're gonna gradually uh, add random people into increasing percentages. So maybe you start by rolling out to 1%, then 5%, then 10%, 20 as you go out. What this does for you in terms of shift right testing is it gives you a way to get software into production. And the dark and dark launching is that you don't see that new feature, that new software that's been deployed until the feature flag is flipped. So it gives you a way to get your software out into production and give your testers or your test automation a way to access it in the production environment before it has the opportunity to be uh, exposed to any of your sort of general users. And it gives you the opportunity to then gradually bring on uh, real production load, real production usage, and learn from that. So as you're scaling up your, uh, your feature flag, maybe you notice something that, um, a use case that hadn't been seen before, or uh, a particular load phenomenon or a particular uh, behavior in your infrastructure that you hadn't seen before, or you can stop or even roll back uh, your dark launch, your feature flag when you see that. And that, that's a, a very powerful capability. And I don't think uh, it can be understated how, how useful that is, particularly in our modern you know, continuous delivery paradigm. Um, I talked about the fact that, you know, any feature flag implementation is going to try to make feature flagging as low cost in terms of checking uh, and even in terms of implementation as it can, but ultimately feature flags are a cost. You can imagine if your code base had if then checks throughout it, how it eventually becomes more and more difficult to understand. So an important thing I think to keep in mind uh, if your development team is deploying using feature flagging for all the power it gives you, you need to keep in mind that as your feature flags are being fully used, as you're running them up to 100 and you feel confident that things are all working, you need to be retiring those from your code base over time. 
And some of the implementations of feature flagging have different support for this. So you may, you may have easier or harder time finding out where all the feature flags are, but ultimately uh, you need to check with some you know, period to make sure that you've got all of your feature flags taken out. There may be some that you keep in your system for a longer time. There may be some you keep in perpetuity if you believe that they are things you want to toggle on and off uh, for the long term. But for the most part, you need to be taking those out maybe every 30 days, every 90 days um, as they fill up. Again, uh, if you think about mobile versus just pure web deployment, there's some things that you want to keep in mind if you're using feature flagging. One of those is that you're going to need to synchronize your mobile front end and your back end. And you may do that implicitly because you have the same user context on the mobile and the back end, or you may need, need or want to do that explicitly. So maybe you let your mobile uh, device pass feature flags back through to your back end to let it know what uh, functionality it expects. And you're also gonna to need to support uh, both your front end and your back end platforms. Now, sometimes these may be the same platform. Maybe your node on the back end and your all JavaScript, uh, obviously on the front end, then you've got one you know, language sort of infrastructure to manage. But most places that's not the case, particularly with mobile development. You're probably you know, on iOS, more than likely you're doing Swift or Objective-C. On Android, you're doing Java or Kotlin. Maybe you've got something else, but those, those are the two likely ones. And on the back end, uh, it's very unlikely you're doing Swift. Maybe you're doing PHP, maybe you're doing Java, maybe you're doing uh, JavaScript. You need to make sure that those are both supported because more than likely, although a lot of feature flagging uh, gets done on the front end, you're almost certainly uh, gonna need some back end support to keep in mind. So having talked about those two deployment strategies uh, to support shift right testing, I just do wanna take a little bit of time to sort of compare and contrast them because they both deal with releasing new features to subsets of users and they both are about decoupling deployment. So putting software into production from release, making it visible to users. So just you know, to go over it, uh, but not to belabor it, dark launches are most often used for new application features in contrast to canary releases, which can certainly support new application features, but are most useful and, and really the only, usually the only way you can support new infrastructure changes. Dark launches are typically looking at how does a user respond to this feature and canary releases are often looking at how does this affect the performance of the system because they're often involving uh, backend or infrastructure features. The dark and dark launch comes from the fact that often users don't know that they're involved in this process. They just are gonna see a new feature at some point. They don't know that they don't or they do at any given time. Canary releases, you may be more explicit about that. You may have people opt into a beta release that uh, cycles them into the Canary environment. Um, but you know sometimes it operates the same way a dark launch does too. So, Having talked about those two deployment strategies, I'm not gonna talk about some monitoring strategies and how those are necessary and how they can help uh, get the most out of your shift right testing. So the first of those is user experience monitoring. And, and I don't know that you know, there's any solid terminology about this, but when, what I mean by user experience monitoring is putting in place facilities such that you can monitor how people are using the system and effectively reconstruct uh, behaviors and states from that. Because if you're going to learn from users in production, you need to be paying attention to them. And again, there are lots of you know, ways to do this. I have some screen grabs from uh, you know, fellow Atlanta company Full Story for their system, but in general, uh, this is about instrumenting your system so that you keep track of your use case and how users are interacting with your application so that you can then uh, replay or reconstruct what they were doing. And that allows you to learn from production what people are doing live. And it also helps you in your own tests in production to know 
what was happening if something did go wrong. You know, for example, uh, this type of monitoring can give you insights from production into debugging that may need to happen to resolve something that you've discovered. So, you know, if you discover a failure in production through your automated testing or through your uh, manual testing, exploratory testing, how are you going to then like quickly get to where that is in the application so you can remediate it? Well, having this type of instrumentation and monitoring in your application will give you that. And again, uh, there are lots of ways to get this. If you're not using something built for it, um, often this can be accomplished through uh, various uh, event monitoring systems that you might have in place uh, so that you can, if you introduce those into your mobile system, maybe you event whenever uh, you go into a screen or a person interacts with a uh, feature in the system. And that brings us to, you know, what mobile considerations there are for this particular practice. And the most important one is the need to instrument your application because mobile applications, at least less so than traditional web applications, aren't gonna necessarily keep track of what a user is doing just natively. In contrast, a web application often is tracking much of its user behavior through navigation through URLs, at least in sort of more traditional web architectures, maybe less so in uh, single page apps today. But you're going to you're going to want to do that so you can keep track of what's going on. And you're also going to need to consider um, all the many mobile devices, networks and geographies that are going to interact with your system. And how are you going to get insights from those? So in production, you'll get a lot of that from your actual users. But you if you want to simulate it, you're going to need to think about um, how you get access to that. Maybe it's through uh, Cobaton or many of the other uh, device providers out in the world. So having talked about sort of monitoring user experience, another element of monitoring that's important to have in place if you're gonna learn from your uh, production environment, if you're gonna learn from shifting right, is to have application performance monitoring in place. And again, here I'm showing New Relic, that is a uh, commercial solution. There are other commercial solutions and there are open source free solutions. I just have this here as an example of the sort of uh, things you wanna have in place. And when I say performance monitoring, I'm not just talking about performance in terms of speed. I'm also talking about performance in terms of uh, system health. Um, are there errors occurring? Um, you know, what does transaction throughput look like, et cetera. And the reason you wanna have this in place, if you're going to be testing in production, if you're going to be shifting right, is because as you're applying either one of those uh, deployment strategies, you're gonna gradually see real users and your test environments and your test scripts interacting with new code. And you wanna be able to identify whether there's anything anomalous happening. So for example, in this screen here, you can see uh, an error rate um, is spiking toward the end. And maybe that correlates with uh, a feature flag expanding. Maybe I've just bumped from 10% to 20%. And maybe I just ran a test script against that environment uh, to see, that, see how it's performing in production. If I see that uh, error, spike, then I may want to go back and halt my uh, rollout and maybe investigate that in some way. Now, of course, there's uh, always, you know, the possibility of some sp spurious correlation, but it's a good thing to know and, and get out in front of if you can. Another thing that uh, I'll note about some of these performance monitors is that they will let you create synthetic uh, tests. These are tests that are not dissimilar from the automations that you're creating in your pre-production environments, but they can be deployed uh, throughout the, if it's commercial tool, throughout their network. And you can use those as ways to test the overall stable stability and performance of your production environment. And you can go beyond just testing to see if it's alive, because I, I don't know about everyone, but I know I've been burned by applications that uh, in production show themselves to be 
available and functional, but a particular transaction is not working the way it should. So these synthetic test scripts allow you to record and play back more elaborate uh, transactions. And I, I just, you know, again, as, as a slight note to uh, some of our products, I'll note that our Catalan recorder will let you record these and then uh, export them to a number of uh, commercial products. Uh, New Relic is what's shown here, but we also do it for App Dynamics and Dynatrace. And you can uh, take those scripts, export them, and then see again in production what is happening uh, around the world. So in this case, I'm seeing uh, my response times from Singapore and Seoul and Sydney. Um, and that gives me the confidence as I'm running that transaction. Maybe it's a transaction that's testing some new functionality that I ran out uh, during my deployment. I can start to get some confidence about that in production by running that test. And it's also, you know, important to be, uh, in particular in the case of mobile applications, be uh, evaluating the performance of APIs and not just, uh, you know, your, your sort of web application because those are so critical to mobile performance. Again, in terms of mobile uh, applications and the considerations to make in performance monitoring, it's the same ones that we talked about in user experience. You need to think about how you're going to instrument your mobile applications to collect data about their performance. Um, again, lots of opportunity, lots of options uh, from commercial and open source, but you want to be able to collect things like how is the mobile system itself performing when there are uh, failures, crashes on the mobile system, are you able to collect those and learn from those? Um, and again, are you able to get uh, test to mobile devices around the world on different networks, different geographies, which of course brings us right back to Cobaton and what they provide for everybody. So we talked a little bit about shift right, shift right testing, what it is, why we do it. Um, and we've talked about some uh, you know, considerations for how to collect as much information about that through monitoring as you can, so you can learn. I'm gonna wrap up just by talking really briefly about a new product from my company, from Catalan, um, that helps you monitor your test uh, executions. And that is Catalan Test Ops. So I'm not gonna go into everything about Test Ops. If you want to learn more about uh, Test Ops, I hope you will. You can come by our booth, you can contact us, but I am gonna talk about how I think it's relevant to what we've been talking about today. And that is in terms of a couple of things. One, we let you monitor and, and help you record the performance of your tests over time. And that's performance not only in terms of, you know, tests passing, tests failing, tests having errors, but also in terms of the actual time taken to run your tests. So if you see something in your shift right testing, you can take a look back in history to see, was there anything that would have predicted this in my uh, pre-production environments that I, I maybe just missed? Um, and that's a really powerful uh, capability, I think. And you can see that here, we've, we've got the test run times going back in time and uh, for a number of tests. Uh, we also do some analysis on tests in any of your environments, uh, such as, are they flaky? Do they run consistently red? Do they run consistently green? Or do they go back and forth? When, which tests are slow? Um, and flakiness in particular, I think, is something that is helpful to be able to go back and take a look at if you maybe attributed some errors in pre-production environments to some environmental, environmental instability and let something go, only to find out that in production it exhibits you know, similar flakiness that suggests that you may need to come back and take a look at that test. You know, and another thing that uh, uh, test ops focuses on is integrating, you know, all of your tools, all of your testing uh, strategy, uh, strategies and environments together. And, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that that includes Cobaton. So uh, we let you connect to your Cobaton account 
and then uh, use that integration to simplify the execution of the automated execution of your tests against uh, Kobaton devices. Again, that's just a kind of cursory look at both how we help you with mobile testing, how we help you with uh, researching uh, issues that you may learn in shifting right. Um, but please come talk to us. Uh, we'd love to tell you more about any of our products, Test Ops, uh, Catalan Recorder, uh, Catalan Studio and its integration with Combaton as well. And we'd love to just talk to you about uh, testing in general and, and how we might be able to help. So I hope that uh, you're able to take something away today. We talked about shift right testing, why to do it, um, why it's important, how it works together with shift left testing and, and some practices that we think uh, make it most effective and valuable for you. I really appreciate your taking the time. I hope we'll get to talk uh, some more. And with that, I'll say thank you and stay safe. And I'll turn it over to Alex to see what questions we've come up with. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cody. That was an awesome presentation. So I really appreciate you uh, running through that. Uh, to remind everybody, we are going to have, you know, five, 10 minutes, depending on the questions that come through. So if you have, um, if you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A panel and we will uh, do our best to get to those right now. So the first question that I see, would you say edge case testing would hold more value in shift right testing? Actually, yes. Um, I think that it is particularly valuable for the reasons that I noted that um, production is where you're gonna find uh, those edge cases expressed. Um, it, it, like I said, you know, you just don't know what the world is going to be like until you get out in the real world. And the great thing too, I think they'll both be the edge cases that you can predict, but also putting in those sort of monitoring facilities that I talked about, that lets you find those edge cases that you didn't expect, but that turn up in your uh, you know, exception reporting and your uh, failure reporting in production and loop those back into your test cycle. Because you know, like I said, it's not, you're, Hopefully, if you're lucky, you don't come to the end after a deployment. You loop back to the beginning and learn something new. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And then the uh, second question we've got uh, to reiterate, is it ideal to use tools like Kobaton or Catalan or others to help us set up additional user experience metrics, much like the ones in traditional web apps, i.e. page navigation? Hmm. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I fully grasp the question, but, but, but I do think that uh, you can apply tools like Catalan and Cobaton um, to producing additional metrics, right? Um, we, we are collecting during test execution, uh, the time required to run tests. We can give that to you. We can give you information about uh, you know, the test success and then connecting with Cobaton, we can, you know, explode that across a number of devices. So I, I, I think it's valuable. Awesome. And I'm, I'm awesome. happy to you know, you know, try to meet with whoever, anyone online if uh, we need to go into more depth. Yeah, great, great. Um, right now that those seem like the only two questions that we have at the current moment. Um, so if anybody has any questions before we wrap up, please do put them in there now. Um, because uh, we will be ready to wrap up in just a minute here. So let me check the chat and the Q and A one more time. Yeah, and I'll note as long as we're uh, here, I didn't I didn't make this uh, you know pitch, but uh, all of our tools, uh, Studio Recorder, uh, Test Ops, um, are available. Uh, at, they all have free levels. They all have you know paid levels as well. But you can get in and try any of them out. Um, and, and, and you can also contact us if you want to, uh, go for a paid trial. Um, but, but please take a look and, uh, I think you'll find them valuable. Awesome. Awesome. Well, who doesn't like free things, right? That is, uh, <laughs> that's great to hear. Awesome. Well, there's some great feedback in the, uh, in the chat. It seems like everybody really enjoyed this session. So thank you, Cody. And, um, thank you to Catalan for, uh, sponsoring this session. And as Cody mentioned, please do make sure to visit their, visit their virtual booth. I'm sure there's a, a bunch of great stuff over there and a lot of great conversations to be had. 
Um, this is the last session for today, I believe. So we look forward to you all coming back tomorrow. Once again, thanks for taking the time to join and um, you all have a, a great, great rest of your afternoons and evenings. Yep, thanks everyone. Look forward to seeing people tomorrow too. Bye everybody. Bye y'all.